Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So we'll start our COVID-19 briefing webinar for um, this month. I'm Dr. Joanne Fernandez, and I'll be joined later on in the presentation by, by my colleague, Dr. Cindy Shen, and we are both uh, Associate Medical Officers of Health here at York Region Public Health. Next slide, please. So just a reminder again that this meeting will be recorded um, during the webinar you'll have the opportunity to contribute or to ask questions and the questions will be gathered um, and sorted and and we will be able to respond to them during the q a uh, section of our webinar um, if you have, have any questions about the recording of the webinar please feel free to contact heoc liaison at york.ca next slide and if you have a question, uh, what you can do is uh, select the Q&A button on the right side of your screen. You can type in your question in the compose box and then select send. And uh, the questions will be screened by the moderator and then uh, posed uh, to us. Next, next slide. And this uh, month, we also have a survey to gather some feedback from you on these webinars. And we always look for opportunities to continue to improve the content that we provide here. So please take a moment to fill that out. Um, the link will be provided in the chat box. Next slide, please. OK, so moving to our agenda for today. So we'll start as always with some uh, epidemiological updates. We'll talk a little bit about some uh, local and provincial policy uh, guidance updates. Uh, we'll speak a little bit about what's happening in schools to date. Um, and then, of course, um, hot topic is uh, vaccines, specifically the 5 to 11 vaccination. So we'll provide some updates on that as well. Next slide, please. Next slide. OK, so our, our York Region um, case counts are presented here on this slide. Uh, we are, of course, still experiencing the fourth wave of COVID-19. Um, and the number of new cases have been declining since September um, and had been recently plateauing. We are seeing a bit of an uptick at the moment, but um, the numbers are still relatively low uh, in comparison to previous waves. So as of November 22nd, the seven day average of cases was 38.9 cases per day. The weekly incidence rate was 22.6 cases per 100,000 population and the percent positivity was 2.1%. And currently what we're seeing in terms of transmission is really that close household contact, as well as local tra transmission are sort of the main drivers um, in, in this fourth wave. So the main acquisition sources of COVID from August to um, the end of November now were um, local transmission, which accounted for about 34.3% of acquisition sources, and close contacts, um, especially household contacts, was about 46% of the acquisition. And the Delta variant uh, to date, of course, remains the dominant strain in York Region and in Ontario. Um, we are, of course, monitoring carefully for the new variant of concern, Omicron, that was announced last week. Um, and as you likely know, it was detected in South Africa and has now been detected in several other countries as well. And there are surveillance initiatives being put in place in Ontario um, and two cases that were just reported in Ottawa as of yesterday. At this moment, we don't know much about its significance and its implications for uh, immune escape, transmissibility or virulence, but of course the information is rapidly evolving. Um, and there of course have been several travel restrictions set in place for travelers from uh, several of the Southern African countries entering Canada as well as uh, quarantine requirements for um, any returning citizens and permanent residents from, uh, from that area as well. Next slide, please. So this graph uh, includes the fourth wave data uh, broken down into um, our various age groups. Um, and while most age groups, as you can see, are experiencing stable or declining rates of COVID, the burden of COVID continues to be seen amongst children, and that's that uh, blue line at the top. So um, the 5 to 11 age group has had the highest weekly incidence compared to all of the other age groups since early October. Um, and while the age group saw a decrease in incidence in the most recent week, it still is trending 
um, higher compared to all of the, um, the other uh, age groups in the population. And of course, the main difference being that uh, children aged 5 to 11 um, have not been eligible for vaccination until, um, of course, last week. And most of the COVID cases that we're seeing amongst children uh, 5 to 11 have been either acquired at home or in the school setting. Um, and in the past 30 days, essentially, the school outbreaks have become a very common source of acquisition for this age group and makes up about of about 47% um, of all cases in the age group. Uh, the other 43% of cases are acquired, as I've mentioned, from a household close contact. Next slide, please. And as, as you can see here as well, the risk of infection remains higher in unvaccinated individuals. And while we have seen the rate of COVID-19 cases amongst unvaccinated uh, residents declining since um, early September, they're still much more likely to contract COVID than those who are fully vaccinated. Um, interestingly, as you'll see, the rate um, amongst fully vaccinated individuals has plateaued really since May 2021, which really speaks to the effectiveness of the vaccines at preventing um, illness. And looking at the numbers based on York Region data from about January 2021 till uh, November, um, unvaccinated individuals are about 12.6 times more likely to be infected with COVID than those who are vaccinated, 21.3 times more likely to be hospitalized than vaccinated uh, individuals, and 33.9 times more likely to die from COVID-19 than those who are vaccinated. So we are, of course, then continuing to see a difference not only in infection, but also in those severity indicators as well. Next slide, please. And this uh, uh, sort of shows the pattern of outbreaks that we're currently seeing in York Region. Um, and while the outbreaks have been increasing since about uh, mid-August, we have been seeing a, a, a bit of a plateau in the past month. Um, but I think what's interesting here is really the story uh, with respect to the pattern of the outbreaks compared to the pre previous waves. Um, and again, I think that's likely attributed to the effect of vaccines. So as you can see in previous waves, our institutional facilities and workplaces made up um, a large proportion of, of the outbreaks that we were seeing in the community setting. Now with the effect of vaccinations, that really has um, decreased quite a bit. Um, and the one setting in which we, we continue to see these outbreaks um, are in schools, specifically also elementary schools, where again, uh, most of the population has not been eligible for the vaccine until very recently. Next slide, please. Okay, and moving on to some provincial and local policy updates. So there have been some uh, updates made to provincial guidance documents, which um, are linked in the webinar, but you can also access them through the uh, ministry website. So first is the guidance around uh, fully immunized and previously positive individuals. Um, and this, the change there stipulates that asymptomatic individuals who are fully vaccinated with high risk exposures um, are now recommended to mean, may, remain more cautious for the 10 days following potential exposures. So as you will recall, um, those who are fully vaccinated are not necessarily required to self-isolate, um, but we are, um, the recommendation has been made that they remain more cautious. And what this means um, is essentially wearing a mask, maintaining physical distancing when out in the community, self-monitoring for symptoms daily so that they're able to self-isolate if any symptoms develop as well as avoiding any non-essential visits to settings with vulnerable populations um, or where there's a large number of unvaccinated people. And this may include long-term care homes, shelters, schools, or uh, child care settings. And then there was some updated guidance provided uh, for primary care providers as well. Um, and this doc document provided some guidance on the transition back to in-person appointments uh, recommendations for providers to implement staff vaccination policies, as well as the strong recommendation that any healthcare workers who are not fully vaccinated and returning from international travel should quarantine for 10 days on return. And the provincial testing guidance update um, was also updated uh, and um, states now that serology testing 
may be advised to use um, a, to inform treatment decisions for patients who uh, may qualify for monoclonal antibody treatment. Next slide, please. There's also been some guidance provided for celebrating safely during the holiday season. Um, and the link is provided uh, here at the bottom of the slide to the to the provincial document. Um, but um, it continues to reinforce that virtual gatherings are the safest way to celebrate, especially if there are people who are unvaccinated or if the vaccination status is unknown. Uh, there are also reminders on the um, indoor and outdoor social gathering limits. So for indoors, um, people are uh, not to exceed the uh, gathering limit of 25 people and outdoors 100 people. And uh, while indoors with people from multiple households who may be unvaccinated or partially, partially vaccinated or if you don't know the status, um, it is recommended that you wear a face covering and physically distance. And for outdoor social gatherings, again, a reminder that um, uh, that if physical distancing cannot be maintained, uh, that face covering is um, is always a good idea, and especially if the vaccination status of individuals who are attending is unknown. And generally speaking, we do say that outdoor settings are safer than indoor ones. However, the risk of COVID-19 transmission, of course, is not eliminated if, if you are outdoors. And um, of course, the reminder that if you are experiencing symptoms, if you're sick, even if mild, uh, that you stay home and you get tested. Next slide, please. And as you will know, um, as of October 25th, there were capacity and physical distancing limits that were lifted in These settings included restaurants, bars, casinos, indoor meeting and event spaces. And there were other settings that were also permitted to lift capacity limits and physical distancing requirements if they choose to require proof of vaccination. So these settings may include uh, things like art galleries or museums. And in this situation, the businesses or organizations can either choose to um, ask patrons to uh, show proof of vaccination um, and in this case, they'd be able to lift their capacity and physical distancing requirements, or if they are not going to be asking for proof of vaccination, that they continue to operate within the current step three capacity. And as of November 10th, Ontario announced that it would be pausing, lifting the capacity limits in the remainder of the high risk set. Things will be evaluated in the weeks to come as well. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And so uh, just to take a moment to speak about some of the more local um, uh, policy initiatives. So in New York region, we did put out a letter of instruction for sports organizations on November 13th. Um, and that and this required owners or operators um, of these sports facilities to require proof of vaccination for all um, those who are age 12 and older at the point of entry who may be attending for the purpose of participating in an organized sport for coaching, officiating um, or organizing or volunteering, as well as for spectators. And um, effective January 1st of um, the coming year, all children will be given a grace period of 12 weeks from their 12th birthday. Um, which would uh, allow for that series of vaccinations to, um, to occur. Um, so during this grace period, they wouldn't be required uh, to show proof of being fully vaccinated. Next slide, please. And um, York Region has also strongly recommended that all local employers institute um, and ensure compliance with a workplace uh, COVID-19 vaccination policy in order to protect their workers and the public. And uh, on October 22nd, um, these recommendations were released along with a sample policy template which outlines the key components of um, a, a vaccination uh, workplace policy as well as some links to resources for um, supporting an educational course on vaccination. And you can also find more information at our uh, website on, on this particular initiative, 
at york.ca slash COVID-19 for business. Next slide, please. So as you will know from our last webinar, York Region Public Health did have a York specific screening tool that was implemented at the beginning of the school year. Um, and really it was intended to be more sensitive to be able to pick up cases of COVID that presented with milder symptoms such as runny nose and sore throat. And we'd done this effort to prevent exposures and dismissals until we had a sense of how things were trending in schools. So following the Thanksgiving holiday in October, we did revert back to the provincial screening tool after observing some stability in our rates um, in schools. And so using the current screening tool, children who are unwell with any symptoms should be staying home. Um, and that's Im important to note that includes also the mild symptoms like runny nose and sore throat. However, only those with symptoms uh, who are experiencing symptoms that are on the provincial screening to tool would necessarily have to go for testing. And so if not uh, tested and if there's no symptoms um, on uh, that they'd be that they are experiencing that are on the screening tool, they're able to return once um, improving for 24 hours or 48 hours for any enteric symptoms. Next slide, please. And there was some additional um, health safety and operational guidance that was uh, provided for schools quite recently this month. Um, and this outlines some increased restrictions on cafeteria use for elementary schools, specifically where the two meters of physical distancing between cohorts cannot be maintained in cafeterias that the students um, are, are, would now need to eat their lunches in classrooms with their cohorts or outdoors. Um, In-person school assemblies for elementary schools, again, will not be permitted um, effective January. And for the winter semester starting in February 2022, uh, school boards can also move back to their regular timetabling models of four courses per day. And with the support of the local medical officer of health, secondary schools are also able to return earlier. So actually um, in York region, uh, we have approved an earlier move to regular timetabling, and this was based on um, the high vaccination coverage rate that we are seeing in our secondary schools, which has um, resulted in a very limited number of confirmed outbreaks in secondary schools. Next slide, please. And there are uh, several testing modalities and options that are available for um, children who attend schools in York Region. So first is our community-based PCR test uh, centers that are available for um, uh, children who attend school as well as children in uh, childcare. And so uh, these are the two locations outlined here and you can also find them on our um, website at york.ca slash safe at school. Next slide. And there are several other testing strategies um, that have been um, also outlined for um, uh, for schools. So first is the take home PCR testing that was announced by the province on November 17th. Um, and so symptomatic students and exposed um, uh, close uh, close contact asymptomatic students and staff may use the home collection kits and drop them off at locations in the communities. And these are um, primarily pharmacies where the drop offs would occur. There's also rapid antigen testing strategies that have been applied on a case by case basis, depending on um, need or whether there's an outbreak in a school. And this uh, may be for the purpose of test to stay, um, as well as for asymptomatic screening. And so it's important to note that for the rapid antigen testing, um, it would be only asymptomatic students who are not part of dismissed cohorts who would be eligible for rapid antigen testing. Um, the province also did uh, announce an additional initiative where rapid antigen screening tests will be distributed to students in public schools for testing over the December break. Um, and also to note that uh, all of these testing programs are voluntary as well. Next slide, please. So I'll pass it over to my colleague, Dr. Cindy Shen, to take us through some of the vaccine related updates. Thank you, Dr. Fernandez. Um, so now moving on to vaccine updates. 
Uh, vaccination rates continue to increase in York Region with more than 88% of York Region residents aged 12 years and older having received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine and more than 86% of residents aged 12 years and older having received at least uh, two doses of the vaccine. The first and second dose coverage rates are lower among residents aged 34 and under and highest in the oldest age groups. And we continue to encourage all eligible individuals to get vaccinated, of course. We're also tracking progress regarding the rollout of the third and booster doses. And of course, the coverage data here would hinge on eligibility criteria for these additional doses. Also, we'll be closely monitoring the vaccine coverage in children age 5 to 11 as vaccine rollout has begun in this age group as well. Next slide, please. So in terms of the 5 to 11 vaccinations, back on November 19th, Health Canada authorized the use of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine in children this age group. And subsequently, NACI recommended that a complete series of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine, specifically the 10 microgram formulation, may be offered to children 5 to 11 years of age who do not have contraindications to the vaccine. We know that COVID-19 may cause serious health problems and long COVID in some children, including previously healthy children. And infected children are also at risk for developing multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, which is a serious event, although uncommon. We have also seen from our data that infection rates are increasing in this age group. In addition to, so in, the, in addition to the health outcomes just mentioned, there may also be a number of other negative outcomes related to infection, including time away from school and extracurriculars, social isolation, and transmission to others in the family, peers, and community. So it's very important to get this age group vaccinated. We know that authorized vaccines are safe and effective and continue to be the best protection against COVID-19. Studies in this age group have shown that vaccine efficacy, immunology, and safety are comparable to results found in older children and adults. And we also have a rigorous vaccine safety system here in Canada, and so there would be continual monitoring of any adverse events following immunization. So all this is really to say that like for other age groups, the benefits of getting vaccinated in this age group far outweigh any potential risk of any side effects from the vaccine, hence the, the recommendation to get this age group vaccinated. When it comes to eligibility, it's really based on the year of birth rather than the date of birth. So children must be turning five years of age by the end of 2021, meaning that they were born in 2016 or earlier in order to receive the vaccine. And as mentioned, children five to 11 years of age or turning five in 2021 should receive the pediatric formulation of the vaccine with 10 micrograms while adolescents 12 years of age and older should continue to receive the adult formulation with 30 micrograms. And the formulation given really depends on the age at the time of an administration. So if a child turns 12 after they receive the first dose, then they should really get the adult formulation for their second dose. We had estimated that about 91,000 children aged 5 to 11 in York region are eligible to be vaccinated. Next slide, please. The recommended interval between the first and the second dose is eight weeks to help provide optimal and longer lasting protection. There's emerging evidence that longer intervals between the first and second doses of the COVID-19 vaccine results in more robust and durable immune response and higher vaccine effectiveness. This interval may also be associated with a lower risk of myo or pericarditis. Co-administration is not recommended for the five to 11 age group. The COVID-19 vaccine should be given 14 days before or 14 days after any other vaccine. In the absence of evidence, this minimum waiting period is suggested to help prevent false attribution of any adverse events following immunization to one particular vaccine or the other. However, to note this is precautionary and co-administration may be warranted on an individual basis in some circumstances at the just clinical discretion of the healthcare provider. And you can refer to this particular ministry document linked here for more information on that. In terms of consent, children five to 11 years of age will require parental concern, uh, consent. Next slide, please. So there are some differences between the pediatric formulation 
which is for use in children age 5 to 11, and the adult or adolescent formulation for use in those age 12 years and above. And as mentioned earlier, the dosing is different here. So for the pediatric formulation, each dose is 0.2 milliliter and contains 10, 10 micrograms of the mRNA compared with the dose of 0.3 milliliter containing 30 micrograms in the vaccine for adolescents and adults. To note the smaller dose, um, you know, smaller doses are often used for children and they work well because children usually have stronger immune response than adults. The pediatric formulation also has an orange uh, plastic cap and has a label that states age five years to less than 12 to help distinguish it from the adult formulation, which has a purple cap. In addition, the pediatric vaccine is more operational with longer stability after unfreezing. It has the addition of trimethamine, which is a buffer added to increase shelf life. The ingredient can also be found in the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine and some routine childhood vaccines, along with a number of injectable medications without safety concerns. And we know that serious allergic reaction to tromethamine is very rare. You can refer to this table and link here for more information on the two formulations. Next slide, please. So in terms of York Region vaccine rollout to this age group, we're working alongside local school boards to launch school-based vaccination clinics in targeted school locations. And these school-based clinics will be held on weekends outside of school hours and operate on a rotating schedule. In addition, five to 11 year olds will be able to access pop-up clinics and community hub clinics across York Region. Every effort is made to make the vaccination process as comfortable as possible for the children and families, including having support to reduce anxiety and vaccine-related fears. The clinics are also made as child-friendly as possible, with stickers given out, extra time for appointments, and additional dividers between immunization stations. Next slide, please. So here's more information about appointment booking. Appointments are required for the 5 to 11 vaccinations and can be booked on our website or by calling Access York. Appointments can only be booked a maximum of 10 days out. So parents can book the first dose for their child and then they'll have to book their second dose separately after eight weeks. Next slide, please. There are also opportunities for primary care providers to get involved with providing uh, COVID-19 vaccines if there is a designated fridge that follows Ministry of Health vaccine storage and handling guidelines. And you can contact us at this email address noted here if you're eligible and interested in administering COVID-19 vaccine at your clinic. Otherwise, please refer patients to our website for more information regarding vaccine access. Next slide. So here are some provincial resources that may be of interest. The Ministry of Health has a COVID-19 vaccine information sheet specifically for children age 5 to 11 and also an FAQ document. The vaccine administra administration guidance has more technical information on the pediatric vaccination and also there are a fact sheet and a poster focused on children and youth. Next slide please. Some additional resources are provided here, most of which are from the Ministry of Health uh, implementation package for 5 to 11 vaccinations, including the mention of a provincial vaccine confidence line and a sick kids consult service for parents and guardians. York Region Public Health also has a phone number, which is listed here. In addition, just last Friday, the uh, Ontario College of Family Physician and the Ministry of Health co-hosted a session titled Getting Kids Back to Being Kids, which had helpful information on the pediatric vaccine and the link for the recording and resources are also provided here. And as some of you may be aware, there is also a Max the Vax sticker campaign, which was created by Dr. Amanda Adams in York Region to help educate and increase vaccine confidence in children aged 5 to 11 and their caregivers. This campaign aims to create a playful and comfortable space for children and their families to learn more about the COVID-19 vaccine, feel safe about vaccination, get a fun takeaway at the same time. And organizations can order stickers and posters to promote the vaccine to this age group. You can click on the link here for more information. Next slide, please. So shifting gear now to third doses and booster doses. 
Back in early November, the provincial government announced an expansion of eligibility for booster doses and third doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. To clarify briefly the difference between the two, um, the third doses are given to enhance the immune response and establish an adequate level of protection for individuals who developed no or suboptimal immune response to a two-dose primary series. So this would be applicable to moderately or severely immunocompromised individuals at an interval of two months or 56 days with a minimum interval of 28 days after the last dose of the initial primary series. So essentially these individuals will qualify for a three dose primary series. On the other hand, booster doses are given with the intent to restore protection that may have decreased over time in those who initially responded adequately to a complete primary vaccine series. So a booster dose uh, is available for a number of groups, six months or 168 days after receiving their second dose. And these groups are listed here. Um, they are selected really based on the, the evidence of gradual waning immunity six months after receiving second dose and also their higher risk of severe illness for, from COVID-19. So please do encourage those you know who are eligible to get these additional doses of vaccine as soon as possible, um, especially with more indoor activities in the winter time and holidays just around the corner. We need to make sure that people are up to date with their vaccines. Next slide, please. In addition, Ontario recently launched a special campaign to support COVID-19 vaccination for individuals who are pregnant, breastfeeding, or planning to become pregnant. So primary care providers are um, can actually help reach out to these individuals and encourage them to get vaccinated as soon as possible. And the 3A approach can be applied here, which means asking if they had a chance to get the COVID-19 vaccine yet, and also checking if they have any specific concerns or questions, advising that one of the most effective ways we can use to protect ourselves and the community is to be vaccinated and uh, really trying to address any concerns they may have. And lastly, acting by giving them information on how to access COVID-19 vaccination. Also provided here are a few resources that may be helpful, including a document from the Ministry of Health and this fact sheet on pregnancy and breastfeeding from York Region Public Health, which contains concise messages on this topic and data that can help support your discussion. Next slide, please. Um, and recognizing in general there is misinformation out there about the COVID-19 vaccines, York Region created a series of myth-busting videos, which will be promoted in our Twitter and Facebook postings. You can feel free to share these with your patients and others you know, and these are all linked here. One last thing before we move on to non-COVID vaccine is that uh, it's really important that everyone, uh, regardless of vaccination status, continue to follow recommended public health measures, such as masking, social distancing, and immediate isolation and timely testing if individuals have symptoms. Next slide, please. So we know that being up to date with non-COVID vaccines is also very important. For instance, everyone over uh, six, actually six months of age or older with no contraindication is encouraged to receive the influenza vaccine. Um, in terms of COVID-19 vaccine co-administration with other vaccines, as mentioned earlier, at this time, co-administration is not recommended for five to 11 year olds as a precaution, although there may be exceptions to that. On the other hand, for those aged 12 years and older, the COVID vaccine can be co-administered with other vaccines. And this really helps with the influenza vaccine program and other routine vaccine programs that were interrupted due during the uh, pandemic. Next slide, please. Another update when it comes to other vaccines is that uh, a few weeks ago, York Region Public Health restarted the routine school immunization clinics for eligible students to receive vaccines against hepatitis B, HPV, and meningococcal disease. These routine school immunizations will be offered at community vaccine clinics and are available for all eligible grade seven students who who will miss their doses of the vaccines and all eligible grade eight to 12 students who missed any doses of these vaccines due to school closures and the pandemic response. And appointments can be booked on the website linked here. Next slide. 
And that really wraps up the vaccine section and I'll hand it back uh, to Dr. Fernandez. Thank you, Dr. Chen. So we do have um, a few questions in the queue here that we'll try to work our way through. Um, so the first question is, um, I heard that parents will be able to choose between a pediatric dose or adult dose if a child turns age 12 for a second, um, the second dose. So uh, based on uh, the guidance that we've received from uh, the ministry, currently um, we will be offering the adult dose um, as that would be what's recommended for a child who would uh, turn age 12. Um, Dr. Shen, I'm not sure if you have anything further to add to that particular question. Uh, so yeah, I think the ministry guidance would have the latest uh, information when it comes to eligibility. Um, so as mentioned, is really the year of your birth that dictates whether you're eligible for the vaccine. And then depending on, um, you know, your particular age, um, when you're due to receive that vaccine, then that would determine whether you're eligible or you should receive the 10 microgram dosing versus the 30 microgram dosing. But I would encourage people to check out the ministry guidance that was linked on a previous slide uh, to get more information because there may be some additional permutations of factors that, uh, that would guide decision making as well. Some of the more specific details would be available in that guidance. And if you ever have any questions, feel free to call or um, uh, access your line as well. Um, and folks will be able to provide you with the most up-to-date information as well. Our next question is um, also a comment. So it seems um, the limits advice seems consistent uh, in that I can go to a hockey game with several thousands of people, um, but the household limits are of course 25. Um, and yeah, it is, uh, it is sort of an interesting discrepancy. I think some of the other factors that um, would come into play here is that um, in some of these larger facilities, they are um, asking for proof of vaccination. You are still required to adhere to um, in the public health protocols with respect to um, masking as well. Um, whereas I think, you know, with the household transmission piece being sort of a very strong driver of um, transmission that we We've been seeing in this fourth wave, um, of course, wanting to kind of keep those household, those limits for gathering um, indoors um, uh, still at that lower level um, because, um, of course, you know, the, the public health measures may be less consistent. There may be people in attendance who are not vaccinated as well. So it is it is a discrepancy, um, but I think there's, there's perhaps a few factors that have weighed into some of that uh, decision making as well. Um, and so one of the other questions is uh, the pregnancy is the pregnancy population um, considered eligible for a third dose? So the um, the current ministry document doesn't necessarily um, differentiate between um, whether uh, an individual is pregnant or not with respect to the third dose. So um, uh, if they're if they do qualify based on some of those uh, immunocompromising conditions, um, they should be uh, able to qualify. Again, would encourage you to have a look at the document that's linked in our webinar for um, a full list as well of what some of those conditions might be that would make them eligible for um, the third dose of vaccination. And the other, another question is, will individuals who have a shorter uh, interval between vaccines be considered fully vaccinated? So currently, again, with the ministry guidance, um, it doesn't uh, differentiate necessarily between uh, those who have had a shorter or longer interval between vaccines. Um, the definition of fully vaccinated uh, is limited really to those, um, whether they have the number of doses at this point rather than looking at that interval. So um, there may be more clarity provided uh, in sort of iterations to come, but as of uh, currently where that document is, it doesn't take into consideration the interval when we look at fully vaccinated. That may be, you know, something that um, is taken into consideration later on if there's a risk assessment that happens on public health side 
but um, but currently uh, the ministry documents doesn't don't provide clarity there or differentiation rather. Looking at some of these other questions, uh, so are um, our grade seven vaccines still available for family doctors to order through public health? Uh, so maybe I'll refer that question over to my colleague, Dr. Shen. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, uh, I, I think perhaps the best thing would be to look at our health provider uh, website. I don't see why it wouldn't be if it was historically available, but why don't we follow up on that to confirm that piece and we can also add that information into our um, document, the Q&A document following the webinar. Thank you. Thank you for that. And so there's a couple of questions as well about um, whether a child who turns five um, in December 2022 would be able to get the vaccine in January 2022. Um, and again, I will refer that one over to Dr. Shen. Sorry, uh, Dr. Fernandez, could you repeat the question? So the question is if a child uh, turns five in December 2022, can they get the vaccine in January 2022? Um, I, I think again, um, I think the ministry, according to the ministry guidance, that should be the case because I'm looking here, children aged five to 11 years of age or turning five in 2021 should receive the pediatric formulation. Um, and it, it was said before that is based on the year of birth rather than the date of birth. Um, so based on the information, that sounds like it would be the case. But again, I would encourage folks to reach out to our phone line. Um, this is still quite fresh and I, I'm not as heavily involved in the vaccine rollout itself. So um, I think referring to the experts in the area who are doing this work day in and day out may be the most helpful and I, I don't want to misinform folks. So thanks. And perhaps we can provide some clarity as well in our FAQ document um, that goes out uh, following the webinar. OK, and I think the rest of our questions are um, repeats of ones that we've addressed. And if there are any um, and if there are any that uh, we haven't addressed, we will um, we will also mention those in our in our FAQ document. Great, and uh, I, I believe we have a couple of other slides just to walk through prior to concluding. So these are just some links to um, bookmark where you would be able to get some additional um, resources with respect to vaccination um, and uh, planning resources as well. And uh, also linked here is some of the COVID-19 guidance for the healthcare sector. So that is guidance that comes from uh, the province. And we also have our uh, report, report of adverse event following vaccination form that is also linked here and um, encourage you to use that if um, if there is ever a need to report an adverse event following vaccine. Next slide, please. And again, some more vaccine resources here and a lot of these are tailored to that 5 to 11 population as well. And I'll, I'll leave these here for you to peruse. Next slide, please. And some additional ones on addressing needle fear in children and some of the uh, needle pain, phobia and anxiety as well. So some helpful resources here too. Next slide. And again, just a reminder that um, you can go to our website at york.ca slash health professionals. Um, and there's the uh, e-newsletter for healthcare professionals here at the bottom of your screen where you can go to sign up um, for uh, any notifications or, or newsletters. Next slide. OK, and that concludes our webinar for today. Please take a moment as well as we mentioned to fill out that um, that survey. Uh, we are always uh, looking for any helpful, constructive feedback. Um, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you.